Hey guys, Crypto Lazy Geek here. Welcome back to the channel. And I have a nice metal box in front of me. What is this? Let's have a quick look inside so I can, without further ado, remove Ooh. this from the box. So this thing is a small, cute refractor by Founder Optics. I've reviewed one of their telescopes on the channel before. It was around 100 millimeters aperture. This one is 62 millimeters aperture and it is a quintuplet telescope. Now I get a lot of review requests from various manufacturers, makers, and everyone. So it's like I reject quite a lot of those and I just focus on the ones that I think are gonna be interesting for the channel that I would have fun testing out and that I'm reasonably sure are gonna turn out well. And this thing, what was the, the thing that made me want to test this? It is the fact that it is a quintuplet refractor with a 62 millimeters aperture. And it is also the fact that natively, it is f4.8. So it's a relatively fast refractor to start with. So we get f4.8 quintuplet in a really small form factor, which is great for travel. I mean, I, 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 I really love those small telescopes that can be grabbed in one hand and, and just like, oh, hugged or anything. It's, it's just so cute. But what really caught my eye besides the initial you know specs of uh, f4.8 was the fact that it is advertised to come with a reducer that puts it down to f3.9 f3.9 in a refractor that's amazing the last time i saw a refractor with like sub f4 speeds was with the vixen vsd 100 and that thing cost like four thousand four five thousand dollars it's not the same category at all so the default specs of this thing is uh 300 millimeters focal lengths with uh, 62 millimeters aperture and in this video, we're going to have a look at the mechanical aspects of the telescope. I really, really want to test it under the stars, but it's been like cloudy and rainy for a long time here in Tokyo. And now that it's finally sunny, it's super strong winds. I'm getting like 10 meters per second wing winds and then gusts are much higher. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm not able to do any astrophotography and yet I am itching to show you this. Another thing that I really like about this little scope is the price. The price is not cheap, but it's not outrageous either. Uh, it is $1,100 with the reducer included. And apparently until the end of March, it is 950 US dollars. So it goes under $1,000 until the end of March. Okay, so at that price, what does it come with? Well, you get the scope. We'll go into the mechanical details of it soon. We also get a manual, printed manual. It's always good to get a printed manual. We get the reducer. So this is the magic thing that apparently brings it to F3.9. And this is where I need to say something. I'm, I, I'm gonna put subtitles if, uh, if Founder Optics gets back to me with an explanation, but uh, the... Uh, the reducer ratio is 0 0.83 times, right? If I do a simple mass, like 0 0.83 times uh, 300 divided by 62, so basically the focal length divided by the aperture multiplied by the uh, ratio of reducing, I get F4, not quite F3.9. So I'm checking on that. I mean, F3.9 and F4 with splitting hair, my guess is that they have some weird way of computing it, uh, with some rounding done here and there so that they could advertise sub F4 to F3.9, eh, whatever. But to me, it looks like it's gonna be F4 with the reducer. Anyway, I'm gonna show you how, to, how we can uh, attach the reducer to the scope later on. Now, it also comes with an M54 adapter if you're gonna use that with full frame cameras because yes, it has an image circle of 44 millimeters, so it should be usable with full frame cameras. I don't have a full frame camera to test it with, but I will be testing it with my Tech APS-C size sensor with the IMX571 sensor in there. It's an amazing camera, and I have links to it in the description, of course, but I will not be able to test full frame. Uh, Pre-installed on the, the telescope itself, it's M48 threads, but you also have M54 threads available in the box, always appreciated. We also get, a dovetail for your guider or your uh, finder scope. We get screws and hex wrenches to attach it to the telescope. We get an additional dovetail bar. 
because the telescope by default it comes with just this very simple uh, short foot but that's not going to be a big problem for me because I use Harmonic uh, or strain wave gear mounts so they don't really care about the balance of declination so I probably will not even bother putting that like big long dovetail that's probably around 30 centimeters long still it's great if you're using a traditional non-strain wave gear mount or you're using a small mount like the uh, the Star Adventurer GTI, then it's great to have this available to at least be able to adjust the balance of the declination axis. And it also comes with something interesting that I like to see. It is a diagonal together with an adapter for the diagonal because yes, you can use it as a visual scope as well. I probably will never be doing that, but it's a good option to have. So I like to see a well-rounded package at such a price. So you have all of the accessories that you would need and that's very much appreciated. Now let's look at the telescope. The telescope by default, it is very short like that. It has a single ring to hold it to the uh, dovetail shoe there or the, the dovetail adapter, uh, but it seems to be like it's a fairly wide ring there. So it seems to hold it in place quite well. The way that you can extend the hood as well is interesting. Normally I'd expect a single locking screw or maybe two at most. Here it is a ring. So you can unlock the hood, pull it out and then lock it back in with the ring without like uh, fearing that you're going to scratch the un underneath that ring. So that's a, a nice little touch. That's really cool. The focuser itself comes with a locking screw, as I would expect. Although once you install an automated focuser on it, it's probably not needed anymore, but it is there should you need it. And as I've seen on the previous uh, Founder Optics Telescope that I reviewed on the channel, the focuser is nice and super smooth. So that's very much appreciated. I, I've grown used to nice and super smooth focusers like the Ascar V focuser was beautiful and this is also beautiful and we do get a tiny window at the top here with uh, position of the focuser indicated in millimeters basically so you can uh, go back to previous focusing positions fairly easily to see what you've been uh, up to with different filters or different cameras or different adapters etc and there is also a rotator integrated into the telescope as i've come to expect with a locking screw so you know, all of the basic features and quality of life features that you'd wish to see in a telescope are there and more because there's something also very interesting that I haven't mentioned yet. And it's that inside the telescope, it's a quintuplet, right? So it has lenses at this end and it has lenses at the other end as well. The space between those two ends is closed. And what Founder Optics have done is they've removed the air from there and filled it in with dry nitrogen. And this is a technique that we've seen in like rugged camera lenses, for instance, or rugged spotting scopes to, uh, you know, make them waterproof. So this, I would not use it under rain anyway, but it is great when you think about moisture that could form inside the telescope uh, from dew, etc. This should not happen with this. So this is actually a super cool little feature. It's not waterproof, but it is like moisture resistant. I don't know, it's a super cool feature. It's probably useless, but maybe not, especially if you, if you live in a humid area. And it's the type of feature that as a geek, it makes me super happy, even though I probably don't need it that much, but it's just cool to think that it's there. And then there's something very interesting as well. There is a tilt adjustment in inside the scope, so it's as part of this plate here, there is tilt adjustment, but tilt adjustment, I normally expect like something like three screws, maybe four screws, usually three, right? We're used to collimating a plane via three screws. This one only has two screws. Well, it has actually four screws, but only two screws that are for adjustment. There are two additional screws to lock the adjustments in place. But in terms of adjustment screws, only two screws. In theory, you'd be able to do the adjustments and once you're ready, you just like lock the locking screws. So this screw will um, adjust one shift of the plane, like I think it's the vertical shift. And this screw will adjust the horizontal shift of the, of the plane. And then we have two screws at the bottom to lock things up. Now I will try to use the scope without messing with those screws for a while, just to see what the default was and whether it works with my camera as is. But it's still, it's a super cool feature to have. Um, tilt adjustment is something that uh, 
I personally never want to have to touch because I'm far too lazy to do so. And these days we have like Blur Exterminator. It will take care of like slightly misshapen stars in the corners. Uh, maybe I'll try it out for this video. But first, I want to get some images in before I start messing with uh, those uh, tilt adjustment screws. Okay, and now has come the time to actually look at the optics. I haven't done that actually. So we'll be looking at the optics together. Actually, you will have the first look at the optics. I cannot see what's happening. I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, here we are. So you guys can see inside the optics before I can. <laughs> well, not quite. If it were live, it would be the case. Uh, let me have a look. Mm, so we have written uh, Draco 62. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention the name of the telescope is Draco 62. It's a super cool name. Uh, Quintuplet Astrophotography Refractor EDAPO. D62 F300 F4.8. And I can confirm overall right now, everything looks quite smooth, easy to use. All of the quality of life features that I expect from a modern refractor while being like usable as is at, at F4.8, which is basically very similar to a Red Cat telescope, or usable with the reducer that puts it to F4 or F3.9, depending on who you ask. And installing the reducer seems to be very easy. Here's the reducer. I can just like thread it inside the telescope. And this is how it looks like once it is set in the telescope. And then I can add the M48 adapter on top. So now without much change externally, we have like the reducer inside the scope. We are now at F. 3.9 or f4 still f4 is amazing for a small refractor like that and so here we have the test setup for the optical test so we have the telescope all set up on the warp astron w20 mount which i reviewed on the channel recently as well it's a cracking little mount and i have uh together with that i have it fit right now with the focal reducer and uh, we have the off-axis off guider from ZW together with, again, a ZW filter drawer. And then a TubeTech IMX571 APS-C size uh, format camera, which I find to be quite excellent as well. Uh, on top of that, I do have some 3D printed uh, cable management stuff on the camera. I'll put links in the description as well to that because I find them really convenient to use. And it is all controlled by the Astro PC Pro. Uh, now, I have featured this Astro PC Pro on the channel before. It's also a really good uh, thing. Uh, the problem that I have is by setting it up here and then actually doing some initial tests during the days of super high winds and then uh, putting my uh, cover on top of the telescope afterwards, the wind rippling against the cover actually ripped the antenna of my Astro PC Pro off. <laughs> So it still works, but the Wi-Fi range is terrible now, which is a bit of a bummer. So I kind of sacrificed my computer for this review. So that's the test setup. We have exactly 55 millimeters of back focus distance between the adapter and the camera sensor, as expected. I have the reducer in there, but I also tested without the reducer. I did some first tests uh, during nights with a lot of wind, but I didn't want to use those results in the video. Uh, last night, we actually had a good early evening, uh, even late into the night. I spent around four to five hours testing the telescope last night, and I did have some issues. The initial frames that I was taking on the Nina preview, uh, I was using Nina for the capture, there were some very obviously out of focus stars on the right edge of the camera sensor, which means that there was tilt, right? And my plan was to not touch the tilt adjustment at all, but I ended up having to touch the, uh, the tilt adjustment. And one thing that was very interesting to me, and uh, as, a, as a lazy geek, I don't really like it, is that there is a permanent gap between that green ring here and the, the black ring here. And that gap allows us to change the angle for the tilt adjustment up to there. That makes sense. But that gap cannot be closed. That gap is um, constantly uh, kept open. There's some like uh, little uh, spacers inside, something like that. And so because of that, there's no way to just like put the two surf surfaces flush against one another to completely cancel out any tilt adjustment. And my big problem is that I am terrible at tilt adjustment. And yes, I spent hours yesterday trying to find the right tilt. 
And I have to say, though, that the, the actual adjustment methodology of like adjusting only one side of the plane or the other is really nice. Uh, but there are better ways to accomplish that. I think the Player One cameras have just like on the large cooled cameras, they have basically uh, four areas where they can uh, do the adjustments and they're across the along those two planes. So it's very easy to do the adjustments. They're accessible from the back of the camera. So you can change the tilt angle anytime you like without having to mess with your configuration. And that's, you know, very smartly built out. And it's just like pull, push screws so that if you want to put the two surfaces flush together to completely stop any impact of tilt, then you can do that, do so, right? And that doesn't seem to be the case with that thing. So anyway, uh, let's go down inside to have a look at those images so you can make your own opinion and let me know, you know, what I should have done to make this better. Before we do that, by the way, I want to remind you that if you want to support the channel at no cost to yourself, you can like the video, you can leave a comment, you can subscribe, but you can also click on any of the affiliate links that I have below, like on Amazon or Agina or whatever. If you have plans to buy anything on Amazon, anything on Agina or on any of the links below, doing it from those links will just help me out at no cost to you. So it's always nice. If you want to be super generous and really like directly support the channel, you can also join my Patreon as a member. Link Links in the description or join uh, my channel as a member and both make such a big difference I would not be able to make those videos without your help so thank you so much okay with that out of the way let's go and check the actual results we're inside and we can now look at the results so the protocol was I took basically 10 seconds exposures with the reducer without the reducer I took them on the horsehead nebula and then I took like 60 10 second exposures of each reducer and without reducer, stack them. So we have a single exposure and we also have the 10 minute stack. There was no processing done the, uh, and no calibration whatsoever done on those exposures. And this was taken with my IMX571, uh, so APS-C size sensor camera from TubeTech, which should give us a good idea of how the stars in the corner look like and whether we could expand to a full frame format without too much worry. On the individual subframes, I didn't do any processing besides an unlinked screen transfer function on PixInsight, which makes the image basically visible to our eyes. And on the stacked uh, frames, I basically did a simple uh, run of Graxpert for background extraction. And that's pretty much it. And one thing to note, of course, is this is after I spent a long time playing with the tilt adjustment using that tilt adjust adjustment system, which on its own is a really good idea. Uh, but in practice, I don't like the fact that we cannot flatten the tilt adjustment planes together to have a standard no adjustment done position. So there are limits to my skill there as well, my skill and patience, because sometimes I know I don't look lazy, but I actually am. And with that, let's look at first the individual frames. So two 10 second frames. And you can see here that on the left hand side, we have the image without the reducer. And on the right hand side, we have it with the reducer. And I have both the image uh, with the full field and also a mosaic with the corner and the sides and the center of the image. So we can have a good look. So let's look first at the non-reduced full image and put it at you know, a zoom level that is fine for just viewing an image on the internet. And we can see that overall it looks decent, although I can feel that there are some star elongation there in the, uh, in the corners, especially like, yeah, in all of the corners, I can see some slight star in elongation. And what's very interesting to me is that it all seems to be in the same direction, like this diagonal direction for all of the stars throughout the image. So we're gonna see what's up with that in a moment. In the center, at first glance, it looks fine. So let's zoom in until we get basically the native resolution of the, cent uh, of the sensor. The stars look nice and round, which is good. Uh, the only issue that I see, and let's look at this star in particular, is there's this little uh, bulge here on the left-hand side. I f I'm not sure if I see it properly, but there's a little bulge there, and that seems to be indicative of pinched optics. At the same time, pinched optics is something that I believe can be detected during manufacturing and fixed during manufacturing. It's not so much about the optics as much as it is about the way that the optics are mounted within the telescope and the telescope that I have, it's an early run. It's actually even a prototype, like a final prototype of the telescope. So will we see the same issue with the production run? 
I don't know, but I really hope that Founder Optics is watching and taking notes there. Because now let's look at the corners. So let's zoom in to the corner of the top right. And that's where we start to see uh, really indicative of pinched optics. And there, there might be also tilt adjustment issues, that's on me. But also when you see this kind of like T shape on the, on the stars, like almost like a cross, the stars becoming a cross, this is basically pinched optics. They're not dramatically pinched. Remember, we're looking at the corner of an APS-C size sensor, but if we're pixel peeping, then definitely uh, we could like not like this, right? And uh, going to the bottom right of the frame, so you can see on the way, I think the stars are slightly out of focus. So again, I think it's my, pit, uh, my uh, tilt adjustment. Uh, but if we go down, we can see again the stars, they look like they have some kind of cross shape to some extent. Now going to the left hand side, again, we see the cross shape. And going upwards to, to, to the top left, we see again the cross shape. It's Every time it's slightly different and I think it's due to the tilt, but it's definitely there. So at least on my sample, slightly pinched optics, something to keep in mind. So if you're a pixel peeper and you're using an APS-C size sensor, this telescope is not for you. That said, if we look just at the center of the frame and we're using, let's say, an ASI 533MC Pro sensor, or we're using a 585 sensor, or we're using a 183 sensor, maybe even a 294 sensor. So all of those smaller size sensors, they would be far less affected by all of that stuff. But APS-C size, definitely affected. And yeah, I wouldn't even attempt full frame with my particular sample of the telescope. The summary is in this, uh, this mosaic, right? The center looks fine, especially at normal zoom levels. And actually, when I look at that mosaic, I'm like, eh, this actually kind of looks okay. And it's, yeah, we did have to go and zoom in a lot into all of those stars to see the issues. It doesn't change the fact that the issues is, are there. Uh, when I was looking at the stars, by the way, I didn't notice that much chromatic aberration. There's the blue halo around the blue stars, sure, but I don't see like other halos around like the yellow stars, but this could be hidden by the pinched optics. Okay, let's look at with the reducer. So now we have the image with the reducer. So let me put it normal zoom level, same story as before. It kind of, it looks perfectly fine when you're looking at, it, looking at it normally without pixel peeping. But now let's have fun and let's pixel peep. So I'm going to go to the same zoom level as before, which is this. And again, I can see the symptom of pinched optics there, the little bulge to, that goes to the left, the little bulge there that goes to the left as well. And uh, we can look now at the corners. So at the side, and I can already see the little cross there happening. And as we go, <laughs> and we're not making the, the telescope any favors because we have a bunch of fairly bright stars with the Running Man Nebula actually in the area. And we can see very clearly the uh, cross shape there. And if we go down, we see the same thing. And if we go to the left, bottom left corner, we see again the cross shapes. And if we go to the top left corner, uh, the cross shapes are actually much less noticeable, uh, but I do see still symptoms of pinch optics and maybe again, tilt. So basically with the reducer, it's the same thing. If you're APS-C size sensor and a pixel peeper, this might not be the scope for you. If you're using a smaller size sensor, this could be good. And there is the big question mark. Is it going to be like that in the final production run telescopes? Because again, pinched optics, they're not a problem with the optics per se, as far as I know, but a problem with how they are mounted. And the problem gets worse when it's cold. And admittedly, it was cold during the nights that I did these, this imaging. I, I kind of got hypothermia, so I know it was cold. So now let's look at the mosaic there. And we can see it's the, basically the same story. Uh, from, far, from far away, it looks fine. It's actually kind of the same story as without the reducer. If I'm looking at a normal zoom level, I'm not shocked or anything like that. It looks actually perfectly fine. And it's on an APS-C size sensor. But again, same conclusion. Don't use it with a full frame sensor. And it might be best to limit yourself to micro four third sensor like the 294 or something smaller like the 533, 183 or 585 sensors. Okay, and let's have a look at the stacks themselves. So again, we have the non-reduced on the left and the reduced on the right. And let's look at the non-reduced. 
put it at the normal zoom level, things look actually perfectly fine. Let's go really zoomed in one to one. We see the bulge. The bulge is definitely there. We definitely have pinched optics. Okay. But otherwise, the stars looks fine. Uh, let's go to the right hand side. We start to see the crosses. It's just like as expected. And we go to the top right and we see the crosses in a way they're actually less noticeable than with the single frame. Um, so, so the stack almost looks better in my opinion than the single frames. And this is at f4.8. Uh, we also see that definitely had like a little bit of tilt. And let's go top left, top left. Basically the story is the same everywhere, right? It's, it's exactly as we expected. There's still a very good point there. I do not see much, if any, like chromatic aberration. I would expect to see like on those bright stars, maybe like a, a different color to the uh, top right and bottom left of the stars, but I don't see that. So if uh, the, the production runs can avoid those pinched optics, I think we have a potential real winner there. If there are no pinched optics, founder, do something. And the mosaic tells the same story. Although for me, the mosaic, like as it is right now, I can't really see, even without zooming in much, I can see slightly pinched optics just at this normal zoom level. And let's look at the overall uh, image. And again, without zooming in, it looks actually, I think really good. And when we zoom in, then we see the symptoms of the pinched optics with the little bulge there. And we go to the right hand side, we see the cross shape. We go to the top right, we see the cross shape and the running man, hello there. Uh, we go to the bottom right, uh, we see the cross shapes and also poor tilt adjustment. Uh, we go to the bottom left, same story. Uh, can someone remind me what this nebula is? Let me know down in the comments. Here we go and it is the same story. The cross shapes are actually not as visible there, uh, but there we are. So now let's look at the image with the mosaic uh, tool. And again, I have like the same conclusion from afar. It actually doesn't look bad. It's when we are pixel peeping that we will indeed see all of those issues. Some of you may ask, what if I used Blur Exterminator on this to basically fix the star shapes in post? Let's try this out. Okay, we've run Blur Exterminator. This is without the reducer, let's zoom in. Uh, I can actually still see the symptoms of the little uh, bulge, I think, to the left, unless I'm imagining things. Uh, so it didn't fix them perfectly, but let's go to the right-hand side and things are so much better. Yeah, who cares about star shapes when you can fix them in post? Seriously, Blur Exterminator is absolutely amazing. But yeah, it's still always better to just get better star shapes at the source. Let's look at the result with the reducer. Uh, let's look at the center. Same story, I can still see some symptoms of pinch, pinched optics unless I'm imagining things. And then on the right hand side, uh, top right, bottom right, bottom left, top left, Star Exterminator makes an amazing job at just like fixing everything in post. I will say that I love the field of view that I'm getting here with this I, I still cannot believe it, F4 refracting telescope. So for me, my main concerns about the telescope are the tilt adjustment mechanism. I wish it was something more standard. Something like this, right? This is the old first version ZW tilt adapter. It's much better now. This thing was a disaster. But anyway, it is able, it has two plates. That should I wish to do so, I can separate like this using like a system of pull push screws on the other side. But I can also unscrew the push screws and screw in the pull screws to get perfectly flattened plates on top of one another, where I am in a default standard neutral position with no tilt adjustment being done. This is the way that tilt adjustment has been done up to now. Founder has tried to innovate with their system, and I think the system is actually easy to use, but it has the biggest weakness of forcing you to play with the tilt adjustment, which for someone lazy like me is not something I like to do. Now, of course, the second point of worry is the pinched optics that we saw. Overall, if there was no pinched optics, honestly, I, would, I think I would have loved those results. As it is, I want to make sure that in the production run, those pinched optics are checked for and fixed. Because when I see like the lack of chromatic aberration and how if you remove those cross shapes, we'd get like really respectable results, especially for an F4 refractor in a $1,000 range, 
get rid of those pinched optics and you have a winner. So it's like, this is a case of like, so close, but no cigar. That said, I'm not aware of any alternatives at this price range that can give you such a fast speed in a refractor. So it is still something that I feel is tem tempting. So my message to founder optics would be, one, make sure that for all of the units that you ship, the tilt adapter is by default at a neutral position, perfectly flat, perfectly parallel. I'm sure you can do that at the factory. And then only people who want and need to adjust the tilt will play with it. A second recommendation is to check for and make sure we don't get pinched optics. If those two recommendations are done, we really have a winner there. So what are your thoughts about this telescope? Let us know down in the comments. Tell us if you know of good alternatives or if you've used or know of telescopes that are just as fast in the same price range because I'd be super interested to know about them. Also, please like and subscribe if you have the time, if you feel like it. It really helps the channel out and it helps my videos get out there. And if you want to really support the channel, you can use my affiliate links down below if you want to buy anything from Amazon or Agena, etc. Or you can join my channel as a Patreon or as a channel member. And you guys truly make this channel possible. I say it every time, but I can't thank you enough. This review has taken me a lot of time and effort to make. I estimate between 20 and 30 hours. So it wasn't easy and yeah, it wasn't lazy either. <laughs> So your support means the world to me, like seriously. Of course, this video is more than 20 minutes long, so I'll have the list of my Patreon supporters and channel members as credits at the end of this video. And But, you know, the most important is whenever you can, don't forget to look up at the stars. And I'll see you next time.